Last week we went to outer space <laughs> for the cosmic and the cosmic Christ. And this week, wow, landed, right? Landed in the heart, just like landed on the moon. I read recently that um, because of the atmosphere, that it's likely that the astronauts who have landed on the moon, that their footprints are still there. And it's kind of the same as in the song that Carol just so beautifully embodied, that everything is there, you know, the imprint of our ancestors, your grandparents and theirs, your aunties and uncles and moms and dads, and the indigenous peoples of the world, there, you know, the very beginnings of humankind and the ancient trees it's all the I am. It's living and it's breathing and it's living and it's breathing in us. And so today, for those of you who were grasping for some terra firma last week, we're landing. And for those of you who are like, darn, I like being out in the spacious awareness. You know, there's a place for everyone in this cosmic Christ odyssey. So we find our way because this this resurrecting of the cosmic Christ, the series that we're in, is, is a marrying of the cosmos and the source from which we came, the everything, the spacious awareness that we can breathe into in any given moment. I mean, that's the beauty of this. It's the allness of who we are. So in any moment, we can go, oh, there I am, and breathe a little easier and open up a little more, and we're, we're back out into that cosmos, you know? And then there's that spark in, in us, that spark of love and connection and, and service and light and, and just when we feel so alive and so, so here and so physical, you know. And that's that, that Christ energy and, the, and that them coming together in expression. That's what's cosmic about this. That's what's amazing about this. This world and this life and this being, a spiritual being walking in a human body. It's just so good, isn't it? When we remember, when we touch it, and, and we, we show up again and we say, here I am. <laughs> like the story of Moses, you know, just he's minding his own business. He's taken his, his father-in-law Jethro's sheep out into the wilderness, and he ends up sort of wandering up or, wa or following them up to Mount Horeb. And you know, in the metaphysics we understand of the scriptures whenever there's a mountain it's it's about us going up into higher consciousness and so there moses is in a place of higher consciousness who knows if he's aware of it he's just you know shepherding his sheep at that moment or his father-in-law sheep and then then lo and behold there's a bush that's burning you know and it's not being consumed by the fire and nothing else is catching fire so it's not only bizarre that the bush is burning but it's really burning in its own sort of space. And so he gets a little closer and he hears, Moses, Moses. And he says, here I am. You know, like there you are in the midst of this bizarre phenomenon and something calls to you and you're just brave enough and open enough and humble enough to go, here I am. Because we know there's a faith that knows that that call is the call of the, the very essence of who we are and the allness of who we are, the allness beyond the cosmos, the source. And so when it's calling us, it's something important. And so it's so important that God says to Moses, come closer, take off your sandals, you're on holy ground. And you know, so often we're just walking along, right, in the world, or we're driving down the road, and we forget, we don't remember that we're driving on holy ground, or that we're walking on holy ground. But when we remember, in those moments we remember, aren't we just so open, so here I am? <laughs> Lord, use me, show me, I'm ready. Ready to follow, ready to go wherever, because I know it's good. <laughs> And that's really the kind of space that, that it seems like Moses is beginning to get into. But then he goes to the little me space. Then he goes to the small s self, the personality, the ego. He gets a little scared because God starts giving him his marching orders. And it sounds like way too big. Go save, my pe go save your people. Go save the Israelites. Free them from bondage. And 
Moses is like, who, me? Like, don't you mean someone else? <laughs> and God said, yeah, you, Moses. Free my people. You can do it, you know? I'll be with you. And Moses is like, oh, no. You know, I'm not eloquent. I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not slow to speak. And God says, I'll be with you. I'll be your, you know, who created the voice, you know, for you? I, I will be the tongue in your mouth. I will speak for you. I will tell you what to say. Don't worry about it. And then he goes, well, well, but who will I tell the people that sent me? I mean, come on. Like, the God of your ancestors sent me, and they're going to ask your name. What's your name? And what does God say? I am. Clever God, right? I am. Tell them the I am who I am sent you. So then, so Moses is going to have stand in front of his people, and they're going to say, who sent you? And he said, I am. And they're going to go, huh? <laughs> because Moses is being called to embody the truth of who he is. He's being called to step into his divinity and to, and to lead his people. And he says, oh, pick somebody else. <laughs> Please choose somebody else. I really, I can't do it. You know, I can't speak. And so finally God's just getting, you know, a little frustrated and says, okay, fine. I'll send your brother Aaron with you. He speaks well. And the two of you will do this together. And that too is really beautiful because isn't it true when we are feeling like there's something big before us that we're being asked to or urged to or somehow just showing up in our lives and we're needing to face. And, and it's like, it's, we can do it with each other, right? So it's not like we never have to do it alone. There's always spiritual community. I mean, look around the room. You've got a room full of folks you could count on. And, and you've probably got others in your life you can count on, maybe even other spiritual communities too. So there's always someone you can turn to and say, hey, I need a little support. I need a little booing up in prayer. I need you to walk beside me or hold my hand or just be here. You don't have to say anything. You know, so there's, there's, there's just so, so much in that little conversation that happens at the burning bush. And it starts with that beautiful, here I am. And then like, oh no. <laughs> but then he, he does it, right? He moves forward and ultimately frees his people. So it's that I am that I am, that I am nature. That's where it all sort of converges together, this idea of the spacious cosmos, the galaxies, our galaxy, and far beyond the stardust that we are made of. It all lands back here on earth, what's the seeming place of, of, of heavier energies is also a place where, where stardust is condensed, that thing that we are made of. And so when we are feeling a little more constricted or a little tighter, or a little tensier or heavier, we can just remember that truth with a breath and expand open into that stardusty essence of who we are, that bright light of the Christ. And that's the part of this resurrection is, is the awakening, right? The remembering again and again. We forget and we remember, just like Moses did in this conversation. You know, hey, I'm willing and pretty curious. And then, oh, no, you know, but then, okay, you know. So we kind of have this push-pull of whatever it is in our lives that's up. But that here I am, that here I am is the opening, is the awakening, the willingness to hear the call, to be of service. And so then it gets, it gets real, it gets real, <laughs> it gets real, real. You know, Jesus always spoke as the universal Christ. So, you know, we know him to be in unity, somebody who just taught us, who showed us what it looks like to be this, to be this universal Christ energy. And so it doesn't stop there, though, and it certainly doesn't in our work in New Thought. It's not like it stops with this idea of this man, now we're going to worship him. No, this man who showed us, and then in our own way, we embody that, that universal Christ energy. This is, this is what he teaches us. Come inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. 
I was naked and you gave me something, some clothes to wear. I felt like a stranger and you welcomed me. I was sick and you came and cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. And the people say, teacher, when did I do this for you? And he says, surely as you did it for the least of these who are my family, you did it to me. And so it's that I am energy expanding out into the universe and landing on earth and saying, what better way to bring forth the essence of me than to, to take care of each other, to connect with each other, to serve in sacred service. And what does that look like? It looks like so many things. I mean, the things he named and so much more, right? It looks like a smile or a hug or a welcome or a, a I love you or I'm sorry or a thank you or I forgive you or I please forgive me. You know, it's, it's those kinds of moments or just showing up at the right time in the right place. One time I was driving in Kansas City and I was on the highway and this was before I knew, I learned quickly after this, that uh, when it's raining you're not supposed to have cruise control on. And it was kind of a light rain but I had the cruise control on and all of a sudden my car started hydroplaning. And at first it sort of, you know, did a little wiggle <laughs> and then it went toward the median and then it backed up and then I was facing oncoming traffic. And I don't even know what got me from the highway down to the on-ramp, but suddenly my car was turned around, not flipped over, but turned around and on the on-ramp facing as if I was going back on the highway. And it just stopped. And it's like the world stopped. And I didn't really know if I was alive or if my Her Hazel the Hairy Mystic, my dog in the back seat was alive, which was the first thing I went to make sure was she was okay if the car was okay. I mean, I really didn't know what it, it was. It all happened so scarily, it like really kind of slowed down on the highway and then very fast, you know? So there I am like stopped. I, I don't even know if I can move the car yet, but I'm on an on-ramp. So if somebody comes around the corner or something to get on the on-ramp, we're going to have a nice little meeting. <laughs> and then this guy shows up out of nowhere and he's knocking on my window. And oh, it was like an angel had come. To have that comfort to see like, oh, I haven't actually landed on another planet. Okay, I am on the road, I am in my car, and there's another human being. And he just was checking on me. And it was just, it grounded me for him to ask the questions and to sit, look and say, oh yeah, it looks like you blew out one of your tires, but you'll probably be able to get to the next place and I'm glad you're okay. I mean, he didn't have to say really much of anything. It was that human presence, right? And I have to believe that that man was in that state of, here I am, you know, where should I be and when? Because <laughs> that's kind of what the here I am does for us. It just opens us up to the Spirit's call and we just show up where we need to be at the right time and the right place. And man, what a beautiful moment of comfort that brought me. And so it is for all of us, if we begin our day with here I am, <laughs> opening ourselves and our hearts and ready to, to be wherever we're called to be. And, and over and over again, we let that be our mantra, then, then we will indeed show up the way that we need to show up where we need to show up. So sometimes people, when they're talking, when we're talking about service or purpose and kind of what is mine to do, get sort of tied up in that, sort of it becomes sort of a paralyzing question, you know, and it doesn't have to be. It can be very simple. So I want to um, invite you to do a short visualization with me if you'd like to close your eyes. And just uh, for a moment, um, take a moment to see yourself at five or six or seven years old and See what you love doing. Just see yourself doing something that you really love doing. The first thing that comes. Just feel that, how it felt to be doing this thing that you loved doing or the place that you loved being. And now let's move to somewhere like teens or 
early 20s and just see what you really love to do at this time. Just a little snapshot of something you really love doing at that age. Then finally, moving yourself to recent times as an adult. What is it that, just see yourself doing something you really love to do. This brings you joy. And now see if you find some linkage between these three things. Maybe there's a theme or a thread some essence of a similar kind of idea of these three things. So it's really that simple, you know, if we're seeking how do I want to show up in the world? How do I want to serve? And the burning bush hasn't showed up to tell you exactly what to do. Follow that, your love. What is it that you love to do? Are you doing that that you loved when you were five or six or a teenager or now? And allow yourself to do that because when we do what we love, we serve in a beautiful way. That's the I am showing up in its most beautiful, most loving, most expressive way. One of the things I loved to do at that middle stage as a teen or even younger was to play sports. And I remember the difference of how it felt in the ways that I showed up doing that. I specifically remember batting and how it felt when I was um, trying really hard, you know? So maybe I'd be kind of squinting from the sun, my jaw might be clenched a little bit and I might be kind of overthinking what's happening in the game. And, and when I would do that, I would notice that when the ball hit the bat, it was sort of a vibrating kind of, it never felt good in my body and it generally didn't go very far. Uh, conversely, when I was in that really relaxed space, that really spacious awareness kind of place and my body was relaxed and I was enjoying myself and I was in that kind of space, then everything moved with a kind of grace. You know, and things went far when I would hit the ball and the bat. It didn't even feel like I was doing anything. It was like featherweight, you know, no vibration, just. And that's applicable to anything that we do that we love and or, or that we do that we do out of kind of a sense of duty, you know, and, and we can apply anything that feels like it's a duty for us to do. We can apply the same kind of open, spacious ease and effortlessness to it. And then it becomes more joyful and vice versa. The thing that we love, we can get, you know, we can tend to get, we love it so much. We want it to, to go a certain way. We can get a little too controlling around it, you know? And so if we let our claws go <laughs> and let the truth, the I am, the, the greater part of us take, take hold of it, then everything flows with such ease. I mean, any everyday life can be applied to this. When I, you know, I remember one time as a young adult going to run errands and trying to, you know, smash them in between work and, you know, get here and get there. And, and I was driving into this little shopping plaza and the store wasn't open yet. And there had been lots of traffic and the phone was ringing. And I was thinking about, and I just stopped myself and went, oh, like, you don't have to do this right now. Why are you doing this? And it was like the heavens opened, you know? It's like those moments when you just realize like you're up to something that's like really not flowing. And there are many more choices than we realize to choose the way of the flow instead of to push up river. And so if we can ask ourselves in those moments when we're feeling that, could I do this differently? Could I do this at a different time? Could I let this go right now? And usually we can. And it allows us then to get into that place that the poet Tagore talked about that is joy. He said, I dreamt, I slept and I, and I dreamt of joy. And I awoke and I saw that life was service. And then he said, I acted and behold, service is joy. And so it is in the, the doing, but not just doing, it's the Chengzu kind of doing 
Wei Wu Wei, the doing without doing that we're after. Because it's the doing without doing that is the given over kind of doing where spirit is doing the doing. <laughs> you know? It's like it's just, it's flowing through us and it's easy and it's joyful and it's fun. And if it's not, then we can just pause and say, okay, what's going on here? Let me just drop into the cosmos for a moment. <laughs> Let me drop into that spacious awareness and then see, is this mine to do? Is this mine to do right now? and then you'll be swept into it, or you'll see another direction to go. And that's really the way we way, right? It's sort of floating on that energy and with that energy and moving with the way that spirit would have us move. At Silent Unity, where I worked for a long time in the telephone prayer ministry, we had a saying at each of the stations where people would receive the phone calls, and it said, it is not I, but the Christ within that does the work. And it was such a good reminder over and over again to give over to that I am essence of us, that Christed nature of us. And so something like that that reminds you to shift back to, to what's really working through you, what's really serving through you, what's flowing through you, what's loving through you. And then it's so much more delightful you know, the Fillmores are behind all of that and all of this, our co-founders, Charles and Myrtle, and they really got this. They really got the, here I am. Use me and allow me to be of service to you. And not only that, but they wrote a covenant with spirit early on when they started Unity. They wrote a covenant to say, this is what we're going to do. And guess what, spirit, this is your side of it. And you might want a, a covenant of your own. I'd like to share it with you. You've heard it before, but I, I, I don't know about you, but I can't hear it enough. It's called um, their Dedication and Covenant from 1892. We, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, husband and wife, hereby dedicate ourselves, our time, our money, all we have and all we expect to have to the spirit of truth, and through it to the Society of Silent Unity. It being understood and agreed that said spirit of truth shall render unto us an equivalent for this dedication in peace of mind, health of body, wisdom, understanding, love, life, and abundant supply of all things necessary to meet every want without making any of these things the object of our existence. In the presence of the conscious mind of Christ Jesus, the seventh day of December, A.D. 1892, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore. Yeah. Nothing stopping us from making a covenant. Here I am. What do you want in return? And don't make any of those things the object of your existence. Remember that clause. <laughs> because it's all a giving over, right? It's a giving over, and it's an asking and knowing what we want, and it's a giving that over. Because it's always better than what we could have ever imagined when we turn it over to spirit, when we turn it over to this essence, this knowing, this deep knowing and wisdom within us. So are you ready to turn it all over, to give over, to start your day and say, here I am, ready? I want to invite Lisa and Carol up to close us out. Today, we'll, our affirmation will be a reprise in song of giving over.